Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming to our, our hurricane seminar. I'd like to thank everybody for taking time out of their busy day and um, helping us in preparing in the event that we do have a storm. We have a, a number of our, of our partner agencies here today that are gonna help us out as well. Before we get started, uh, we have uh, our mayor here today and she would like to step up and say a few words. And I uh, also just wanna let the public know it's, it's very uh, reassuring when you have your public officials in your corner and, and, and emergency management and everything like that. And I'm grateful for the mayor being here. Ms. Mayor. Oh, I don't think you want the opportunity to have me start singing and dancing, but it's, it's you know, I feel like I should. Um, welcome. First of all, welcome, everyone. Um, I just a little bit. Uh, my name is Holly Smith, the mayor of the city of Sanibel, and welcome everybody here and welcome to everybody that's listening online. And we appreciate you being here for this really important meeting that we have every year. Um, I came to Florida in 1988, so my first experience uh, with a hurricane was Hurricane Andrew, if any of you were here and remember that. And I can tell you um, that was certainly the time before we had cell phones, before we had social media. And I remember my parents being up in Maine, and Dan Rather got on the news and said, Southwest Florida has been wiped off the map. And my parents weren't able to find out if we were okay. Well, I was in Cape Coral and I was walking my dog um, when it hit. And, and certainly I did see the aftermath of Hurricane Andrew as we went to Homestead. My husband and I do quite a bit of fishing down in the Keys. And we went through there and we saw that devastation and what it means when a hurricane comes through. And we should never take it lightly. We will always assume when they give us a warning that this is gonna be the one. We need you to always listen, we need you to pay attention, and we need you to react and use the information and tools that you have available to make sure that you and your family are always safe in the event that we do get that one. I have been here for all of the other subsequent hurricanes. Um, I don't have all the names, but I think we could go through the alphabet a few times over. I was living on Sanibel when Charlie came through. My house was under construction. We were evacuated, we heeded the call, and I would tell you that some of the people that did not evacuate and heed that call will tell you now they should have. There was a lot of fear during that time, and I'm not trying to scare anybody, but some people you hear, we're gonna have a hurricane party, we're gonna have fun, that is not how you should look at it. We have been very lucky, um, and we need to continue to really stay vigilant, listen to these seminars, we're very fortunate with the staff and the stakeholders that we work with throughout the county um, here on Sanibel, we will communicate well. We always do and we'll continue to have that communication. So I welcome you all today, thank you, uh, and listen well. And if there's any questions for any of you, we are certainly always available here on Sanibel and at the county level as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Chief Dalton and let him continue with the program. Thank you very much. Okay, we are having a little bit of a technical difficulty with the clicker, but um, I'm gonna announce our first speaker, our weather consultant, Dave Roberts. Dave does a great job giving us a very specific uh, forecast and, and description of what he feels is, is gonna happen here on our island. I know, um, I guess it was probably the day before um, Irma hit, Dave and I were discussing whether we were gonna have an East Sanibel and a West Sanibel because the track of Irma was coming basically right down, uh, right down Tarpon Bay Road, so I think I think we have some movement here. So we'll be just a, just a minute, Dave, and then we'll, we'll do what we're normally gonna do. I think he's running it down. So today, uh, like I said, we have our weather consultant, Dave Roberts. We have, from Lee County's EOC, we have Sandra Tapfumane. Sandra is in charge of the EOC. Um, from Fish, we have Maria Espinoza. We have our building director, Howard Law. And we also have our deputy public works director, Scott Crawshack. So 
So this can just video is just to give you a little bit of uh, what we might face. I'm not saying we're going to, uh, it's not a prediction, but this is a category uh, four storm. So th that's, that's a little video of uh, why we need to take this stuff serious. We live on a barrier island. The elevation here is an average of about three feet. And we'll go into a lot of more details uh, throughout the presentation, but we could face that. So we have to be ready for it. And this is the destruction that Hurricane Michael did, that video that I just showed you. So, Okay, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Dave Roberts. He'll kick off our, our presentation, and then we'll work our way through uh, all of our speakers. And I would ask everybody to keep your questions to the end. We'll have a question and answer ses session. And uh, a lot of the questions that you might ask will probably be covered in the seminar. So, all right, thanks everybody. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hello, hello. I just found the new title for my autobiography. We're gonna call it Technical Difficulties. I think that's what we're gonna go with. It's so nice to see all of you. By the way, if you did not uh, get an online reminder, uh, we actually had a special reminder of the hurricane seminar last night that rolled through Sanibel in the middle of the night, uh, just to alert you uh, that we do get storms this time of year. We haven't had a real rainy hurricane seminar in a long time. I've been doing this for a few years. Um, is, is this a first time seminar for any of you? Who's a first, who's a newbie, okay. All right, very good, thank you. Appreciate you being here. Uh, how many of you have been here coming to these things for many years? For your frequent flyers? Okay, you get, mile, you get miles for coming to these things. You know that, okay. Um, when I started doing these seminars, and I've been trying to figure out when I did my first Sanibel seminar, but all I can tell you is I used to count the gray hairs. All right, that's how long it was. Now, half of today's seminar is sponsored by Just For Men, available at CVS and Walgreens. Okay, so with that, we're going to move things along. We're going to talk about the chance of hurricanes in Sanibel on average. I'm also going to tell you the day and time of the next hurricane hitting the island. No, I'm not doing that. That's, that's sorcery. If, if I'm going to do that, I'll have a little table set up outside with my little snake oil to sell as well after the seminar. But I am going to give you some information. I want you to come away from this educated, knowing more about the hurricane history of Sanibel. And I'm going to move through these graphics, and I'm only going to pick out probably the most important thing you need to know, okay? So this is not something where you're going to get three college credits for... Uh, uh, for hurricanes. But this is one of the hurricanes that stands out. For those of you that have been here a long time, uh, I went through uh, Hurricane Charlie um, in many different aspects. Uh, by the way, I want to take off uh, the mayor's story real quick. She mentioned about uh, Southwest Florida being wiped off the map. We all thought this would be the one that would wipe Southwest Florida off the map. It did a tremendous amount of damage um, to Sanibel and lots of other places. To get back into my house, I, I lived at the time off of Plantation Road. I had to literally Really scrape, use a, a, a scraper to get the debris out of my door jams. I couldn't open the doors to get into my house. It took me about an hour, but that was good. That was in great shape. The other thing that was really convenient is they moved City Hall over to the Crown Plaza, which was right by my house. So everything was very convenient at the time. I will tell you, I'm so impressed with this city on how they react and how they do decision making. It really is one of the shiny examples when you look at cities across the United States in a hurricane risk zone and how they prepare and how they act. So Charlie came through, and by the way, the, the storm you were referring to in 19, was it Andrew that they said wiped? Yeah, uh, they spelled Fort Myers M-E-Y-E-R-S. Just making you aware of that, it was on t-shirts and it was actually in the newspaper. Can you imagine how embarrassing that is? Anyway. Uh, hurricanes, do they happen here? Yeah, they kind of do. Um, they kind of happen all over the world. So before you elbow your partner next to you and say, why did we move here? Uh, I want you to know that you could have picked many worse places to move. Um, I wouldn't want to go to Thailand or, you know, some parts of uh, the Indonesian area. But yeah, Florida, you are not alone. Sanibel, we are not alone. Hurricanes happen. This is that part of the world. Why? Well, you need a few things to make them happen. One is... Moisture, do we have enough of that around here? Yeah, all right, yeah, I think so. Fuel, we need water temperatures of 80 degrees or higher. And instability, eh, you gotta have uh, some of that, and there is a lot of instability around here, uh, not just in the drivers on the road, but also in the atmosphere. Uh, so can you imagine, look at the lower right portion of the screen there. Can you imagine, I'm four years old, 
okay? I have lots of questions about the world. And in my house, I turn to my mommy and daddy and I go, how are hurricanes made? Can you imagine that conversation, how tough that was with a budding meteorologist? But they sat down and they gave me the facts and we know that storms start off as thunderstorms, okay? Every thunderstorm could possibly lead to a tropical system, but it has a lot of things to go through, such as becoming a tropical depression. And we give it a number if it becomes a tropical depression. Then we call it a tropical storm when the winds get over 39 miles an hour and we give it a name. And then if it becomes over 74 miles an hour at wind speed, we call it a hurricane. So that's really the progression. All right, on this map, determine your risk. Well, uh, I'll make this simple for you. Yes, 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 and yes. Okay, we have all the risks here. We're on an island. When I first started doing this seminar, uh, these seminars 20 something years ago, um, I remember somebody coming up to me after the seminar and said, I know everything you just said, but what's the highest point on the island? So we gave her her money back. Um, yeah. So you can see on the scale on the left though, what I wanna point out to you is the scale on the left shows how the differences work between hurricanes. So uh, it's not just the difference between one category, a category two and a category one. We're talking 20 times the damage potential between a cat one and a cat two. And you look down the screen, cat four, cat five, it gets even worse than that. So storm surge, is it an issue around here? Yeah. Storm surge is basically a storm system that is offshore and is churning up the wind, which is then pushing up the waves. And so you've got your normal high tide, and then you've got your storm tide, and it amplifies basically. So let's get real about storm surge. Storm surge is very common on Sanibel. Let's not kid each other, okay? Now, we don't get 20 foot storm surges here. That happens a lot when these forecasts come out, everybody freaks out. What I'm here to tell you is even a one foot storm surge is dangerous. Okay, so before you think, hey, I'm just gonna hang out. I, I'm, I, you know, I live on pilings and I'm doing great. No, one foot of water will knock you off your feet. It will also move a car. So when there's storm surge protected, adios, okay? These are the categories of hurricanes. Once a storm reaches a hurricane and you can see the damage on the left-hand side versus the wind speed or in the category on the center and the right-hand side. And you can see, we haven't had too many category fives here, thank goodness. Uh, category fours, yes, we've had them. Uh, so they're very dangerous. Now, we talk about El Nino and La Nina. You've heard that probably spoken about more in recent history. El Nino is when the Pacific warms up. It has an impact on our area. Why? Because a warmer than normal Pacific leads to a cooler than normal Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf. A few degrees is wonderful news when it's a few degrees cooler in the water. It really helps things out. Unfortunately, this year, we're thinking there's gonna be a little bit more of a La Nina, and that means the quantity, the number of hurricanes or tropical storms is going to be a little bit higher than usual. El Nino is great because you could see that little jet stream in yellow, it kind of plows into the hurricanes. So a lot of hurricanes don't get a chance to develop, but when you have a La Nina, the jet stream is farther north in the Atlantic, that means more storms get a chance to develop, and that's obviously a big concern. So, give you an example, an El Nino on the left, a La Nina on the right, the La Nina, more hurricanes, El Nino, less hurricanes, but again, I'm here to tell you, when there's hurricane season, we only care about one storm around here. So, whether we have 28 storms predicted or three, it means we're still at risk, understood? When can you find a hurricane? Well, if you're a, a hurricane tourist, um, the first week of September, second week of September, Prime time to find hurricanes anywhere in the Atlantic, Gulf, or Caribbean. So if you're coming over here from another continent and you're saying, I've never seen a hurricane before, what's well, a good time to come? September, all right? I'm waiting for Airbnb to change their pricing accordingly, but September. Uh, that's where they breed, in the red zone. That's the prime highway. But when patterns shift, high pressure, this and that, that highway shifts with it understand the problem we could have around here. And notice there's a little hole there in the Gulf of Mexico where storms also spawn. So that's the spawning ground for hurricanes and tropical storms. Have we seen a change in the seasons? Yes, we have. But I'm here to tell you before we get into that whole topic, we know what topic we're talking about. Before we get into that, I wanna let you know our detection of tropical weather is exponentially higher than it was decades ago. So we're able to see and track a lot more with intricate detail.
The forecast for this hurricane season so far has been released by Colorado State University. Yeah, how many hurricanes did they get out there? If, in fact, if they get a hurricane out there, we've got even bigger problems around here. But they are the leading experts. Uh, NOAA is giving their forecast, I believe, in the next few days. Um, I think next week. Um, but bottom line, the takeaway is here they're predicting 19 named storms. Nine of them will be hurricanes. Um, and four of those, basically half, will be major hurricanes. Okay, hold on. Anybody here have storm anxiety? I do. You know why? Yeah, me and, here was me last night, storms rolling through, and I keep looking over between iPad and phone, and I'm like, why am I doing this to myself? You know, you gotta remember something. It's like we get thunderstorms, we're, we get hurricanes in the Atlantic, Gulf, Caribbean, regardless. So take a deep breath, remember, these are things that don't come out of nowhere. We have time to track and time to prepare for these things. My job here is to communicate with the managers of Sanibel the actual hurricane risks specific from a storm. We use the forecast cone. If you're from another part of the country, you may have heard of this, the forecast cone. Some people call it the cone of uncertainty. I don't even know what that means. I'm uncertain what it means. So I call it the forecast cone. And it basically nails it two out of three times where the hurricane's gonna wind up in that cone. When we're in the cone, pay attention. When we are in the cone, pay attention. We get in the cone often. That doesn't mean the storm hits us often. We're gonna discuss that. So you ever really like spaghetti, right? Anybody not like spaghetti? You can't be my friend if you don't like spaghetti. Cause yeah, okay. So um, the spaghetti plots, everybody loves to contact me. I'm not saying from the city of Sanibel, but I'm just saying in friends in general, uh, whether it's my good friend, Dr. Roy in the audience or Dr. Phil, they say, uh, what do you think about the GFS? And I say, um, I, think, uh, I think it's one of the models because a lot of these models react differently to different weather scenarios. So I just wanna tell you, when you're looking at models, make sure you take them with a grain of salt. If you really wanna get into it, there's hundreds of these. So a lot of times you'll see on TV the most common ones. Hurricanes are different animals, depending on what they are. Uh, her tropical storm Marco, all right, was about the size of Sanibel, all right? Almost like a tornado. Uh, super typhoon tip, anybody wanna talk about that? I don't, I don't ever wanna see it. And by the way, it's a typhoon other part of the world. Fortunately, we don't have storms like that. Have you seen the list of names for this year? Uh, they alternate between male and female. They weren't always that way though. You know, the hurricane names used to start off only as females. Yeah, I'm not gonna say who came up with that. Then the women's lib movement came around and said, come on, quit blaming us for everything. So we put the male names in there and now it alternates between international too. So you get all kinds of French, Spanish and what have you. All right, let's talk about Sanibel, what you need to know. This is what they don't print on the back of the brochure when you move in here, all right? Your realtor may not have told you about this. I'm here to tell you what this is all about. Sanibel hurricane history. I went back to 1852, not personally, but in the record books. What did I find? Since then, there have been 55 tropical storms and depressions, or can we say and or depressions, not hurricanes, that have come within 50 miles of Sanibel, all right? 21 hurricanes on top of that. Out of the 21 hurricanes, 13 have been major. So you get an idea that mm, about half the time, if a hurricane's gonna impact us, it's probably gonna be major. And the reason I say that is because, think about Florida, we kind of stick out into Hurricane Alley. So when you do the breakdown on this, this is where I, I, I broke out the calculator here. Uh, actually, I didn't, it's called the iPhone. and I found that there's one tropical system that comes within 50 miles of Sanibel every two years. It's really about 26 months if you wanna be technical. One hurricane every eight years. Anybody feeling better yet? Yeah, you are, okay. One person, I'll take one. Uh, one major hurricane every 13 years. That's some good news. Asterisk, there have been gaps of up to 40 years between hurricanes. When I started doing these hurricane seminars, I used to say all the time, it's been 40 years. Remember the, yeah, the, um, the lady from Titanic? It's been 84 years. I used to say it's been 40 years. And unfortunately, Hurricane Charlie ruined that. And I can't say that anymore. And then of course, all the other hurricanes that have happened. So now you know the truth about hurricane history in Sanibel. This is not the most hurricane prone place um, in the country or in the world, but 
hurricanes are a fact of life. And I hope you all stay safe this hurricane season. I hope the worst we see is the weather that we saw overnight last night. Thank you for giving me your full attention and time. It's always a pleasure to speak to all of you. And I'll be here at the end of the seminar if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, next up for us is Sandra Tapfumene from the Lee County EOC. Thank you, Sandra. Okay, hello everybody. It's always a pleasure to come out to this seminar. I always enjoy it every year. Um, and I love following Dave, isn't he so animated? I, I love listening to him speak. Um, so I just wanted to add a little bit of information that we found out. Last week we went to the Governor's Hurricane Conference. It's a conference that the uh, Florida puts on every year. And the director of the National Hurricane Center was there. And you know, he said that um, a lot of the information that he was sharing was, was a little alarming. I wanted to just share some of that with you with the, with the, uh, just to stress what Dave was saying about the number of storms and kind of the severity. Um, they are uh, increasing in number. They're getting a bit stronger. Um, he shared that between 1963 and 2016, that's a 53-year span, um, we've had more hurricane category four and five storms since 2017 than we did during that 53 years. Um, so they're getting more intense. And you saw the list of names that Dave put up. Um, the, Ken Graham was saying that, you know, they've run out of names for three years in history where they've had so many storms that they have to go through all of those names. They used to have a Greek alphabet that they went through when they went through those names. And uh, they've shifted that now. They've added an entirely different list that they're going to start to go through. Um, but those three years were 2005, 2020, and 2021. So, you know, are we living in an age where we're going to be seeing more hurricanes? Likely, yes. Um, but the good thing is with hurricanes is that you can prepare for them. You know that they're coming. Um, I'm from the Midwest, and in the Midwest, uh, aside from snow, we have tornadoes. Uh, those of you that maybe if you were living here in January, you noticed that not a few miles from you up the road off the island, we had an F2 tornado that ripped through three mobile home parks and destroyed about 150 homes. Uh, we're still working on the recovery for those residents that are living in that area. They had very little notice uh, that that tornado was ripping through. So um, our office in emergency management for the county, we deal with all hazards, whether it's tornadoes or hurricanes or cyber attacks or terrorist attacks. But today uh, we are here to talk about hurricanes. Um, I did want to point out in your bag as you came in, and if you didn't get a bag and snuck in without getting one, you can get one on the way out. Um, there is an all hazard guide that is inside that bag. Everything that I'm gonna be covering today, you can find in that bag, uh, along with a lot of other information. Um, and up on the screen, uh, our website, the leeoc.com, uh, you can also find that in the guide. Uh, that also has a lot of very good information. If you go there, we have a hurricane uh, at the top, a hurricane tab you can click on, and that brings you to our hurricane preparedness page. So if you need more information uh, and uh, that we either don't cover today or you want to go back to review, you can go there. Uh, also, during storms, that is where we're going to be posting all the up-to-date information. We also have an app called the Lee Prepares app, and it's a free download. We're actually going to push an update to it around June 1st for this next year. We have some upgrades that we're um, bringing in. But we have uh, a lot of information on there. When we activate, we'll have things like which shelters are open and what resources do we have in the community. So that would be a good thing to download. Again, that's Lee Prepares. Um, and then we have a notification system called Alert Lee. Sanibel is a user of that system. Um, if you sign up at alertlee.com, you can select uh, to put your cell phone number and tie it to your address. And that way, if there is an alert that the city sends out and you're not at your home, you'll still get that alert. Um, we push things like uh, evacuation information through when we do large scale evacuations across the whole county. So that would be an important thing to sign up for if you haven't already done that. Okay, so let's talk about evacuations and why do we evacuate? And really there's two reasons why we would call for an evacuation related to a hurricane. So storm surge, which Dave has kind of already touched on, and that for us is the biggest hazard that we could uh, evacuate a significant part of the population. For Hurricane Irma, uh, we evacuated roughly 300,000 people from the county. 
Uh, Hurricane Irma happened in 2017, if you're new to the county. That was the largest evacuation that we had ever called in the history of Lee County. So we had a number of people uh, that were really caught off guard a bit because they had never been called for an evacuation. You all live on Sanibel, so uh, you, know, you are gonna be one of the first ones that we evacuate off. We want to give you some time to get off the island and not cut, get caught up with quite as much traffic as everyone else that might also need to evacuate. Um, so hopefully you're not caught off guard. I'm here to tell you don't be caught off guard because you'll be the first ones that you know, we, we do call for that evacuation. So that's storm surge. Wind is another factor. So we do have a number of mobile and manufactured homes in the county or if people are dependent on electricity for any medical equipment or medical needs. And evacuations are mandatory. So, uh, you know, we don't come through and pull people out of their homes and force them to leave, um, but we do like to remind you that first responders also evacuate. So if you choose to stay for some reason, um, and, and, and that's your decision, then you're gonna have to wait for our first responders to get back on the island. I know that they would uh, very much encourage you to leave. Um, because it could take them a little while to get back over, uh, depending on debris and assessing the bridge and making sure everything is safe. Uh, so this is just my personal picture from deploying to Hurricane Michael. So this again was in the panhandle, that category five storm that Chief Dalton showed at the beginning of um, the seminar. Uh, that storm hit Mexico Beach in 2018. And there was a team of five of us from our emergency management agency that deployed to the panhandle to assist Bay County with recovering and responding to that event. So this, again, they had approximately 18 feet of storm surge um, right on the beach. There was a house that was directly um, behind me that had been mitigated. You could tell that it was likely built with higher building codes. Um, it did withstand the uh, storm surge. It probably had water that still went through it. Um, but at least it wouldn't have been a, a complete, uh, this is a destroyed home, you're gonna have to tear that down and build it back up. This took place, this picture that I took, uh, was not, October was when the storm hit. We went back after we had deployed for a couple of weeks, we went back to uh, Mexico Beach in February. So this was six months later. They are still recovering from that storm, um, and this is 2022, multiple years later. So recovery takes a very long time. I just wanna set that expectation. Hopefully we won't ever be in this situation where we have to rebuild homes to this extent here on Sanibel or in the county. Um, but it is very challenging, especially if you are in an area with widespread destruction, when it's not just like the tornadoes, for example, or just a little part of the county, it's gonna be a little easier to get them back up and, and uh, rebuilt. Um, but if we ever have a large scale disaster, uh, our county uh, team is going to be working with FEMA and your city partners here and the, the city government in order to identify damage levels, report that up to FEMA as quickly as possible and get that process started as quickly as we can. And we'll be sharing all kinds of information for you during recovery times. Okay, so how can you prepare? Again, this is a great time. I congratulate all of you for being here because you're taking that first step in being prepared and receiving information. So what we want you to do is if you don't already have a family plan that you have, an actual physical plan that you have uh, printed out from a computer and it is in your hand, we want you to spend some time. So there's, there's about two-ish weeks um, until hurricane season, and but it's coming rapidly. Um, so this is a good time to go to our website again, which is leeoc.com. We have a fillable PDF family plan that you can just fill in the information. We've thought of all the questions to ask and then print it out. Don't keep it on your computer because if you lose power, then you're not gonna be able to, um, it's not gonna be very helpful for you. Um, but it will give you things like uh, the ability to write down phone numbers. Um, if you're like me and you don't know any phone numbers in your phone anymore, you rely on your phone. If you lose power, you're not gonna have the phone numbers that you need. Um, it has areas for insurance information, medication. Um, if you have a boat, um, there's a section for that, pets. So check that out. Um, and that again is at leeoc.com. We want you to build a disaster kit. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute and then stay informed. This is our website here, so it's that gray bar that you see up at the top. If you click on that, we have some new videos that you can watch with very specific um, focused information from members of our team. And uh, they're very engaging. We have a very good public information officer, so they're kind of fun to watch. But you can go and listen uh, to those videos for some more information as well. 
Okay, so let's talk about our evacuation zones. Normally, uh, when I do seminars across the county, I'll have people take out that all hazard guide, open it up to the middle, and you can see this evacuation zone map right there in your book. And I'll tell them, call out your evacuation zone when you find it on the map. Uh, you guys are all the same answer, right? So, so which, which one are you? A, okay, A, it's much easier, right? Uh, so what we, what we want you guys to do, and again, this map, let me just say, is based off of that storm surge inundation information that Dave was sharing with us. So we've run models and models. Um, we get information from the state of Florida and the National Hurricane Center, which helps us to draw these lines across the county, and it helps us to understand, okay, if we have certain amounts of storm surge, we're going to need to move people out of the way. And then they continue to provide us information specific to the storm as it's arriving. So you know they have the hurricane hunter planes that fly through the storm. How would you like that job? That would be kind of fun, right? So they're flying through the hurricanes. Um, they're collecting all kind of data that will assist us with making evacuation decisions. And once we know, well, what is the wind speed going to be like? How much water can we anticipate coming up above land? Then we make evacuation decisions based off of that. Um, so this is really important for you not only to understand where you live uh, in zone A, um, but you know, coming up with a plan of where you're going to go from here and having an evacuation plan in place is really important. So hopefully you already have that plan in place and you know where you're going to go, but in case you need some assistance, here are some, a sample evacuation plans. So you know, only stay home if it's safe. I would recommend probably for you guys that will likely not be um, any, uh, a possibility unless it's a smaller tropical storm that's coming through and we're not as concerned about storm surge. That may be, that may be a reality for you. If you are evac or staying in your, host, in your home, we said it's safe to do so for a smaller storm, just make sure that if you don't have hurricane impact windows that you are still um, either putting up shutters or moving to the interior of your home. Then the other plan B would be to move outside of the evacuation zone. You don't necessarily have to go hundreds of miles away. All you need to do is get out of the evacuating area. So if you have um, friends and family, this is a great time to make some friends that live out in E or you know, in the white area of the county. Um, just, just come up with a couple of different plans. So I'll, I'll share for our family, we have friends that live on the east coast of Florida that we could evacuate my, my kids out to, my husband. But if they are, like Irma was a good example where the whole state was kind of covered and impacted, well, we ended up um, in that scenario evacuating them up north to stay with family members. Um, so to have a couple of different options just in case just getting out of the evacuation zone might not be uh, enough. Plan C, hotel would be good. Uh, keep in mind, they book very fast, very early. Most hotels in Lee County don't have generators. So keep that in mind too. So if your plan is to go there and you think you're gonna have air conditioning, that may not be the case. Uh, so, but a hotel is another option. Plan D is our emergency shelters, which I would highly not recommend. Uh, pretty much any plan is gonna be better than going to one of our shelters. So this is a picture of Hurricane Irma, 2017. This is, Germ uh, at the time it was called Germain Arena, now it's Hertz Arena. We had roughly six to 7,000 people that were in that building. Um, again, Irma was a really unique and large scale evacuation for us, like I mentioned. A couple weeks prior, we had been watching all these Hurricane Harvey images coming out of Texas, and there was a ton of flooding there. And so people kind of, they really did panic, and it was a huge storm. And some people flew down to help some of their family members get out of the way, and then they became stuck themselves. Um, so we did have a lot of people in shelters because they didn't have a good evacuation plan in place. So again, you're going to be much more comfortable if you have another option. Uh, we like to say that shelters are the lifeboat, not the cruise ship. Um, so if you absolutely have nowhere else to go, then come on over. Um, but we really, really recommend you finding another option. Um, every shelter that we open, um, when we have an activation, we'll have some form of pet sheltering available. So if you do have a pet, you can bring your pet. We just ask that you bring supplies to take care of your pet and cages um, so that you can kind of contain, contain your pet. Um, special needs sheltering, there is a brochure in your bag. If you know anybody that's dependent on electricity or is on oxygen, we do have special needs shelters available in the county and the Department of Health uh, helps us to run those. You do need to pre-register for those ahead of time. Building a disaster supply kit. And this isn't just for hurricanes. You know, we have 
tropical or uh, uh, thunderstorms and other events that happen, and, and it may just knock out your power. And having these supplies in handy would be helpful. Um, but a water supply, one gallon of water per person in your family, uh, it would be recommended. We say anywhere from five to seven days worth would be ideal. Um, don't forget your pets; they also need that water. Uh, medications that you might have um, that you can store ahead of time. These, this picture here is of a solar-powered cell phone charger. They're relatively inexpensive, but when the power goes out, you can just go outside and charge your cell phone. Uh, NOAA weather, weather radio is good because you can get those alerts even if the power goes out. And having cash is really important because you would need to, if potentially, if you're trying to get food and all the power is out, they're going to be only accepting cash in most places because they have no way to um, do the transactions using that electronic format. So definitely have cash on hand. And before the storm, we want to make sure that you are clearing away any kind of debris from your home, tr loose tree limbs, anything that might become um, a flying impact to your neighbor's house or your own so please make sure that you're removing those, get them trimmed. Um, ensure um, that you are getting fuel. Uh, so this time of year, it's best if you can maybe not go below a half a tank just to make sure that you have enough fuel if you need it in order to evacuate. Um, definitely, we want to make sure that you're turning off your water, if you, whatever the water supply that's coming into your home, if you are evacuating. We've had some instances where there's been a, a, a pipe that's burst and it's kind of flown back into and flooded people's homes. Um, inventory your home. You all have a video camera pictures ability on your cell phones. If you have a cell phone, uh, you can easily go through your home and inventory it ahead of time for your insurance. If you've ever gone through any kind of flooding or fire event, it's very hard to go back and remember what exactly you had in each of your rooms. So doing that ahead of time can be very helpful. And then after the storm, so we're going to try to get everything back up and running as quickly as possible. We have a plan in place to clear roads um, and making sure that we're removing debris. Only call 911 for life safety emergencies. We will have a 211 information hotline, so you can call 211 if you have any questions or you need some guidance. Um, we already talked about staying on firm ground. Even if you have evacuated off of Sanibel and you are seeing flowing water anywhere, be very careful. Um, we've had um, a herd of deaths even across the state of people driving through uh, water. And you, sometimes you don't know if the road has washed out underneath that um, or you can be carried away very easily. So just don't, don't drive through water. Um, and definitely make sure that, you know, we have a lot of animals that are out and about. So if you're coming back and you're cleaning up your yard, make sure you're wearing gloves, poke through that area before, um, you know, you don't want to have a surprise. Uh, we've heard stories, just check your cupboards so that critters haven't crawled into those cupboards when you come back. Um, do kind of a thorough check and just make sure that you stay safe. And generator safety, just make sure if you do have a generator, which is great if you do, but keep that generator 20 feet from your home. Uh, we've had at least one or two calls every storm we activate where people don't realize that keeping it in a carport in a garage is not safe, and then we have carbon monoxide poisoning, and so we want to avoid any um, indirect deaths from that hurricane, so make sure you're safe with your generator. If you're concerned about someone coming to steal the generator, you can uh, cut a chain and kind of tie it around a tree or something else, but just make sure it's further away from your home. Um, I think it's my last slide here, but just so that uh, if we do run out of power and the, you can't get news on your TV and your normal news stations, um, hopefully you have a radio. If you have a car, at least, you can probably still get a radio, right? So 90.1, that NPR station, WGCU, we're going to be broadcasting information through their services, um, through the, the public radio system, um, that, that will still be running. So if you need information, you can always go there in case everything else is unavailable to you. Okay, with that, I will pass it back over to Chief Dalton. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandra. And uh, next up, we have Erica from FISH, our nonprofit organization on, on the island. She's going to explain what benefits they, uh, benefits and assistance that they offer to our citizens. Thanks, Erica. Hi, my name is Erica Royals. I'm the Senior Services Director over at FISH. This is going to be very short and sweet. We had wonderful information from all of our uh, partnerships. So I'm here just to talk about um, our hurricane preparedness. This is just for um, Sanibel and Captiva residents. Uh, 
Okay, wonderful. So FISH works with city emergency response and emergency management teams to ensure that all of our islanders are prepared for each hurricane season. In particular, we serve all of our residents with a hurricane information preparedness package, which complies, it has uh, compiles resources information uh, to prepare for the upcoming, upcoming storm season. Residents can request a visit with a FISH volunteer to go over the emergency information and create an emergency plan. The island's most vulnerable residents will be placed on what we call an active list, which will be shared with the city of Sanibel, Sanibel Police Department, and emergency management teams. Um, I, was, I am head of the uh, Hurricane Committee. Um, they are, it's basically a, a group of volunteers that once we get our packets back from our active uh, participants, the call will go out and let them know that we have a storm on the horizon. So in this packet, which I have plenty of, we have a list of county shelters and maps, um, hotels with generators, a um, pass application form for the city, Medicare, Medicaid, and disaster emergency area information, hurricane information phone numbers as well as websites, emergency supplies checklist, and a checklist for uh, animal services, pet shelters. We also have a special needs brochure and application upon request. Some of our special needs is uh, through the Lee County Emergency Management. We have a family emergency plans. We have evacuation routes, the special needs programs that we had spoke about, the public shelters, emergency supply kits, and available resources during a disaster. Anyone can request a packet to be mailed to them by calling our phone number. Packets can be picked up at our main office off Periwinkle Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. You can also download a packet uh, from our website. If anybody is having trouble filling out the packet, we have our volunteers that will help you fill them out. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. And uh, next up is our building official, Harold Law, to discuss building codes and flood hazards. Thanks, Harold. Well, I'd like to thank you for being here. Yeah, there it is. As everybody, I hope you know that everyone here lives in a flood zone. Flood zones are all regulated by the Department of Federal Emergency Management, affectionately known as FEMA. And all the flood zones have depths in which they have determined what water will get on your property. As the building department, we work every day of every year to make sure your property is built high enough and strong enough to take care of the hurricanes that uh, may come through here. Um, this is a program, even with FEMA, and the requirements that you have, they also sell the flood insurance in which you have to buy if you have a mortgage. So. If you go to Bob Insurance Company or you go to John Insurance Company, you're still buying the flood insurance from FEMA. So they're very uh, insurance conscious about making sure whatever you have is above and beyond the approach of flooding from hurricanes because that's the only flooding we will really get here. And the building codes in which I also enforce Make sure that your house doesn't blow away. I think you've, uh, in the past, they, they had pictures of uh, Mexico Beach and uh, showed all the devastation. And there was this one house that was standing and none of the others around it were all gone. I know the, the, the people that, that built that house made sure that they followed the building code when they built that house from the ground up. And that's why that house was still standing and the others were gone. Um, 
as the building department, we are very strict on this in the city to make sure we follow the minimum building code so that you can stand assured when you evacuate, you will have something to come back to, okay? And as we've spoke before, we, they've talked about floodwaters and we've talked about evacuation and all that's very important and you should remember it and I will reiterate that, but heed the warning of evacuations because you want to get out first and you want to get the best hotel rooms first. Uh, and this is a, a, just an example of where FEMA has a line drawn in the sand or in the air of where water could be if a bad storm did hit. And this is their prediction. This building here is brand new. Uh, the building before that was here that was built many, many years before, the floor here was four foot lower than what you see now. And when we were all sitting in here, I could always say that when the storm comes, you're sitting this deep in water. Not anymore. This is what FEMA requires, is to be up high enough so when the storm comes and leaves, you've still got your structure left. And like I said, with that being, you know, we talk about everything, FEMA is the people that will help you, but you have to have FEMA insurance in which to, you know, in, enjoy some help from them. And with that said, thank you. Thank you, Harold. We'll, we'll now move into the portion of um, our seminar where we talk about what we do specifically as a city, what we do in preparation and mitigation, how, what it looks like when we evacuate, where we evacuate to, and then re-entry and recovery. So I know we asked this question before, or it, but I, I asked the audience at this time, why do we plan? Can anybody try one answer why we plan? Well, we plan in order to save lives. As I said before, we are a barrier island, and if we have a storm coming, there's a very good chance we're, we're going to need to evacuate. So we try to get everybody on board with this early and, and uh, announce when the storms are coming. Uh, this next slide is um, it's about uh, 10 years old now, but it was a study a person did nationwide about the most difficult places to evacuate from. So the fifth worst is southeast Florida, and that's mainly because it's so populated. Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties have very high populations. Um, after that, New York City and the New Jersey coast, they've, they've learned that that's very difficult to evacuate from, too, and that's mainly the same reason because of population. And three, the Delmarva Peninsula. That's kind of obvious. It, it is a peninsula. You've got to travel up out of the peninsula to get out of harm's way. Oh, I hit the uh, button a little too fast. Tampa Bay is the second worst place to evacuate from in the country, and the, first, the, the very worst place to evacuate from in the country is southwest Florida. Our population is probably quadrupled, and we still only have I-75. Finally, they added one more lane, but that's our only way north and south. So that's why we ask everybody to, to heed the evacuation order and do so early. This is an evacuation order. I signed it at the bottom. That was right before Hurricane Irma. Um, that's our partners meeting. Uh, uh, Mayor Ruane was there um, um, in the picture. Um, we were explaining to a lot of the same folks that are here with us today, the partners are the, those folks that are going to help us put the community back together. We have a partners meeting scheduled for two weeks from today, and we just kind of update everybody's information, and then we don't hold another partners meeting unless we have a storm bearing down on us. And we kind of game plan what we're going to do to recover in, in that partners meeting. Um, if time allows, we will send a team out to do a door-to-door -door check. Um, right before Hurricane Charlie hit, there was an older couple that lived um, a little bit west of center in the island, and they were almost kind of like shut-ins. They didn't know the storm was coming. Um, they were both sick, and they both kind of took care of each other. And then when Charlie hit, we were without power. Some areas on the island were without power for, um, for three, three weeks, but a lot, a lot of the island was a good week to 10 days. Those folks might not have made it. 
So it's not something we can guarantee you we're going to do, but as long as we have the manpower, we will go out and do a door-to-door -door check. Uh, These are some of our preparations from Irma, our public works folks boarding up City Hall and the police department. These are some pictures from when Hurricane Charlie hit, just to show you the damage that happened here. You can see the big trees down. Um, I had explained to someone earlier today, um, when we came, the, the morning after Charlie hit, we came back on the island, a whole, practically the whole police department, the fire department, and we turned on Periwinkle, and we had to stop right at the Derrick Queen, because from that point on, trees were stacked up about 10 foot high for three different areas of about a quarter mile long. So I point this out because these, these power poles, um, our LCEC rep has told me that they're supposed to be rated to take 200 mile an hour winds. And you see one of them is snapped and, and another one blown down. We think that Charlie spun off a, a small tornado in the area of Middle Gulf Drive and Casabell Road. Uh, as you can see, here's another one that's, that's snapped. This is uh, along Middle Gulf Drive as well, a roof ripped off. It's the back of that same property. So, you know, um, we, we, we can suffer significant damage here. So it's, it's a very serious situation. I like to say this is not what we consider a timely evacuation. Uh, we would like to see this individual get out sooner. And one thing you can see with the, at the bottom of that tree, there's a huge re root ball that pulls up too. And a lot of folks don't realize, and I'd have to say we didn't really think of it before, Charlie, but we certainly experienced it afterwards, that that root ball pulls up water lines and sewer lines and causes all kinds of problems. Just about as much as the tree does uh, above the ground, the root ball does damage below the ground. Remember, all hurricanes are similar, but no two are alike. This one here, this slide here, shows the hurricane on the left, uh, Floyd. It's, about, it's bigger than the state of Florida. And then the one on the right is Hurricane Andrew, and we all know how, how damaging that was, but you can see it's maybe a third of the size. Um, as we saw with uh, Mexico Beach and other areas, this was Hurricane Rita. It went through, um, this, this town is right on the border of Texas and, and Louisiana, and you can see it, it virtually um, scrubbed that, uh, that island clean. So things that we learned from, uh, fr from Irma, uh, all of our city employees have to be prepared to work outside of their assigned duties. Um, if uh, we have the staff and we do that door-to-door -door check I, I mentioned, um, residents and property owners, we know they're, after the storm comes through, they're desperate for uh, accurate and timely information about what happened to this community, about what happened to Sanibel. So the better homes and businesses are prepared for evacuation, the more successful our job will be. If we had a basic like uh, uh, one-on-one -on -one class on hurricanes, what we'd say is five days prior to the uh, expected landfall, um, we start a, 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 a timeline of responsibilities that we do. Um, each employee is responsible for complying with the timeline. Um, preparations at home. We have our, our, our uh, employees start to prepare their own homes about five days, when, when we're five days out in the cone. Have them secure all loose items and all hurricane shutters. Make sure you have enough water. That's uh, one gallon per, uh, per person per day. It's recommended to have enough um, for seven days, enough supplies for seven days. And if you're going to book a family uh, evacuation, get your family out of here, you're probably going to have to do it um, at about the five-day mark because the airlines, as the storm gets closer, they start flying all the planes out of here so they won't be damaged. Other preparations at home, you have flashlights, batteries, cell phone charger, and dry foods or MRE type foods. Um, and you can obtain that stuff either online or at camping supply stores. And this presentation will be on our website. It looks like some folks are taking notes. So if you want, you can just go on the website and, and access this information. And um, we will have a video of this seminar as well. Uh, that'll, be, that'll be ready fairly soon. <clears throat> Uh, each department has a specific set of plans for their employees. Uh, essential employees, we have them prepare a bag where they have clothes, a sleeping bag, uh, prescription medicine, and we tell them you've got to be ready to go uh, at all times, and you've got to be ready to stay three days. Uh, individuals make, we have a, uh, all of our uh, employees, we encourage them to make a family hurricane plan. The EUC, as Sandra had said, has a plan. That's just a copy of the title page there, and this is just uh, some other uh, pages in in the plan, but as Sandra said, I concur with her 100%. Print it out and then and get the items that you and, and your family will need 
And if you have that written plan, like any other plan, a business plan, a written hurricane plan like that, um, if you have a, a written plan that you've completed yourself, you're 75% more likely to be successful than if you don't have a plan. So I encourage everyone to get a plan. That's the EOC, the big building we just saw. I show everyone a slide because our recovery efforts for Charlie, I think we're right around, uh, costs were right around $10 million. And the, the chair that's up in the far right corner, that's where our individual sits. And we have to order all the um, supplies, all the equipment, all the requests for manpower through the EOC or else it is not uh, refundable. So it's very important that we do our work through the EOC because out of the roughly $10 million it cost us to recover from Charlie, we were refunded about 75 or 80%. That's what the EOC looks like when it's full. That's a meeting uh, before Hurricane Irma hit. There's about, I don't know, 100 or 120 people or so in there. It's a busy place. So we have a hurricane action plan. That's an incremental timeline for preparedness. Um, each department is responsible for certain elements in the plan. And it follows a, a, a time window such as you see there, from 72 hours out all the way down to 18 hours. <clears throat> That's our uh, organizational chart. And I know some folks who were in attendance this morning have seen the chart. Um, that's under normal operation. That's what it looks like when we're in a, uh, in a declared emergency. So as you can see, it's, it's considerably different. And uh, every, every, uh, every different department is pitching in in one way, shape, or another to help, because recovery is a, a very difficult task. <clears throat> Us, the police department, we maintain and facilitate that hurricane action plan. We maintain our professional contacts and relationships within uh, emergency management at the county level. Uh, and then we improve the city's preparedness and safety through strategic planning and through education. This is one of our uh, biggest educational uh, opportunities, so we're always, we're always happy to um, and excited for this one. Uh, the city will issue weather alerts. We'll keep the community informed of storm status by using uh, Dave Roberts, our, our weather consultant, and we'll issue emergency alerts through our Facebook page. We don't have the Twitter account active now, but we would activate it, and we would also use our Alertly emergency notification software. And like I said, we have our partners meeting. Um, that's who we put together, a uh, team we put together and discuss how we're gonna get this, uh, the city put back together. Just some examples of who would come to that partners meeting are the sheriff's office, our fire department, Lee, Lee uh, Electric Co-op, the, the EOC, and numerous others. And this is when we were evacuated. Um, on the left was when we evacuated for Hurricane Charlie. There actually are dispatchers there. And we, we had an off-island uh, EOC ourselves. That was at the, uh, uh, the Crown Plaza at the Bell Tower. We had all the phones forwarded there. So when people called the station, our, our dispatchers answered it. The picture on the right, we were in a first responder shelter right before Hurricane Irma hit. And that was uh, the sheriff at the time, Mike Scott, him, the deputy chief, and I. Uh, <laughs> When I was younger, I could probably tell you everybody else at the table, but I can't see it now. <laughs> so, City activities while we're evacuated, the temporary city hall, the functions we did there, we held community meetings. You know, we briefed the media, um, we uh, registered licensed contractors that wanted to come out and do business, issued hurricane passes, um, posted, uh, made web postings, and we posted in the beginning, like say the first one, two or three days after Charlie, um, the whole infrastructure was damaged in the area. So we had like a plywood um, uh, a bulletin board and we posted pictures to it. Of, uh, we had a helicopter fly over the, of the island and we took those pictures and posted them because we, we didn't have any real way to disseminate the information to folks other than that. Um, and our re-entry activities, for five days that sign was up after Hurricane Charlie because we did have the island closed. It took us that long to get about 75% of the, of the main roads cleared. It was, it was weeks before we got everything cleared. This is uh, the first morning um, when we're re, uh, uh, allowing folks to come back in. Uh, initial, the initial re-entry is from police, fire, and EMS. Um, citizen safety, uh, protection of property, and clearing the roadways, they're our initial priorities. Uh, restoration of services such as electricity and water and sewer, they come after that. Islands divided up into 10 zones for re-entry. Um, re-entry of the public will depend on which zones are affected. 
If we have, um, say, zones in the middle of the island and we know we can't get down Prairie Winkle or you can't, can't get up Sand Cap Road, we, we won't open those zones. All you're going to do is have folks come on the island and then just become frustrated they can't get to their house. Uh, the reentry hang tag program assists in security and organizing and, and organized reentry. Uh, hang tags are important because they help maximize security measures while providing authorized persons access to a property. Uh, hang tags expedite your return to Sanibel, but your, your driver's license will get you back on also. Hang tags are, they also assist in, like I said, a, a phased reentry back onto the island. This is a picture of them. Um, the uh, one on the left in blue is residential, and the one on the right that's orange is our business hang tag. Uh, when we first get back on the island after a major storm, like after a Charlie hit, we set up a command post, and the police uh, and fire, well, we have to do a search and rescue of every structure on the, on the island to make sure that there's uh, no one injured in it or nothing worse than that. And while all that's going on, we still have to do security on the island. So we have, uh, we have assistance from other agencies. As you can see there, that's a National Guardsman. We had a troop of Nas National Guardsmen out here on the island after Charlie. We also had, we had Gainesville PD here. We had uh, Clay County uh, uh, Sheriff's Department here. We had, in the period of about two weeks after Charlie, we had about 20 different agencies come to Sanibel and pitch in and help our police department um, recover um, set up pods for our citizens, and then uh, perform our normal security work that we do as police officers. So, Okay, so now we're at the point where we're going to discuss recovery efforts. So our Deputy uh, Public Works Director, Scott Krawshack, is here, and he's going to pick up for me at this point. And after his um, discussion with you, uh, that'll be the end of our uh, delivering of, of information to you. And, and after Scott's... Um, presentation will open things up for questions. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Scott. Uh, hello again. My name is Scott Krosnick. I'm the Deputy Public Works Director. Um, so uh, Public Works would, would manage debris removal operations. So uh, timely removal of vegetation um, from the roadways and roadsides is extremely important because we want our partners to be able to come back in and restore your services and utilities, because my goal is to get you to return to normal life um, as soon as possible. So these are just typical images you can expect to see, you know, um, returning on the island right after a major storm. Probably things you guys have already seen. They were taken mainly during Charlie and Irma. So. <clears throat> The city has uh, contracts in place, pre-approved contracts with two disaster debris recovery contractors. Um, you know, after a major storm, the city does not have the staff in-house to handle the, the workload that's required. So we would bring in a, a contractor that's specialized with assisting us with the, the cutting and the removal and the hauling of debris. So, <clears throat> you know, that slide on the right, you can, that's a, a claw truck they, you know, they would bring on the island. I think during Charlie and Irma, we had about 20 or 30 of those trucks on the island at one time, you know, trying to uh, handle the volume of, of debris. So we also have um, in place contracts with two uh, disaster debris monitoring contractors. So they, they would be brought in to help city staff with um, quantifying the volume of material that's being hauled, and they would help the city with the FEMA paperwork. because. Uh, the paperwork's very important because we want to make sure that the city is getting reimbursed for the full amount that we're due because, I mean, as the chief said, it's a very expensive operation. So uh, I did jump ahead a little. So this, this image here, this is um, the city's main disaster debris reduction site that's permitted through the DEP. It's located on Island Inn Road, and all the debris that's picked up on the island will be hauled to this site. And um, our contractor typically would then grind the material to reduce the volume, and the last step would be to haul, you know, the mulch or the, or the ground material off the island, and um, we, would, we would restore the site. Just another, another image there for you of that, of that site. So um, that's, that's all I have, so thank you.
um, we'll conclude the seminar. And the last few things I'd like to say to you is, everybody, please make your family hurricane plan so you're, you're preparing to be successful. Heed our evacuation warnings and obtain your hurricane reentry pass. Thanks, everybody, for coming, and let's hope we have a slow season.